At that time when Jesus had come to Nazareth, he said to the people in the synagogue, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his own home, in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through the midst, he went away. The good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is said that today's friends are tomorrow's enemies. But as the wise guy remarked, some don't wait that long. The crowd that was singing Hosanna on Palm Sunday soon turned to crucify him on Good Friday. Well, in the gospel today, they don't wait that long for the week. Because let's get the context of the gospel. It's Luke chapter 4. Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth. He goes into the synagogue. He opens Isaiah 61. He reads the text. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. He has sent me to give good news to the poor. And then he concludes that section by saying, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, hearing this, we are told in the text, in the verses that come before today's gospel text, that the people in his hometown were impressed. And so the crowd, however, impressed as it is, is soon going to become a mob. There's going to be a mood swing. He's just a local boy. They want him now to do his, the wonders he has done elsewhere to do it in his own hometown. They find it so hard to understand how this simple, ordinary person, the son of Joseph, whom they knew so well, could be capable of all this. They held within themselves prejudices. Don't we know him? There's nothing special about him. They are willing to accept him if he is willing to prove himself with all the wonders that he has been credited with in other places. Jesus is conscious of that. But he's not going to perform a divine magic show. He's not going to oblige them with a shock and awe display. No, he's not going to do that. His aim was to proclaim the kingdom of God, to bring about a better and a just world, what he called, as I said, the kingdom of God. He was quite clear what he was going to do, inspired and led by the Spirit and the Father. His ministry to the poor, to the brokenhearted, and not just in Israel, but the whole world, as it were. Now, the town people of Nazareth, they believed that they were God's chosen ones. And that is where their world began. And that's where their world ended. They wanted to resist the new and dangerous ideas that Jesus was now proclaiming to them. Universalism, or what I would call the globalization of grace. His aim was to bring the good news because it has no boundaries. God's grace and God's power cannot be restricted to boundaries of nation, race, culture, language, whatever. So Jesus is proclaiming what the kingdom of God is all about. He's speaking of a bigger world. He's talking of a greater horizon. Much bigger than what they have been used to. It's too much for them to grasp. It is too much to understand and far too much to accept. Their prejudices, their blind spots, their labels influence them and you would say even blind them. They believe that their opinion, their perspective, their interpretation of events, of reality is the only one. Now what was it that provoked the people of Nazareth to turn against him? 
Well, in the course of speaking to them, Jesus uses two well-known stories or examples from the Old Testament. Elijah, who was, went, who was sent to the foreign widow in Zarephath, and Elisha, who healed the leper, Naaman of Syria, which we heard in the first reading. And it is this sto these stories that provoked them so much so, they wanted to take him onto the top of the cliff and throw him down to his death. But Jesus slipped and went away. Now, what does the first reading tell us about? It? This Naaman was this high-placed Syrian official who suffered from leprosy. And as the turn of events happens, the young domestic maid, captured of course, but treated with kindness over there, she suggests maybe the prophet Elijah will be able to heal you. And so he goes. He goes with, as you heard in the reading, goes to meet the prophet Elijah, who's, whom he thought would have a shock and awe kind of display. The prophet Elisha doesn't even step out. But he instructs him to go to the Jordan and to bathe seven times. Now, Naaman brought all his contributions and wealth and thought he, it would be something very dramatic. But for him it was a shock. There are better rivers in my country. This small little meandering river, the Jordan, of a poor nation and a despised nation as that. And in a half he just wants throws his tantrums and wants to walk away. His prejudices do not allow him to be open to the healing that is being offered by God through the prophet Elisha. But thankfully his servants plead with him and he allows those prejudices to drop. He goes ahead and is healed. He begins to realize not just the healing, but to realize that this God is the God of the universe, not just in Israel, but of people all over. And he takes a little earth from that land as a significance of worshipping Yahweh. What he realizes, there are no limits, no boundaries to God's grace. But sometimes our prejudices, the labels that we put on others, prevent us from recognizing the hand and the grace of God. In both the readings, we see a word that is offered. In the first, Naaman was offered the word. He rejected it, but then he accepted it. In the gospel, the word was offered by Jesus. At first they listened, but soon they rejected. What we see that Naaman was able to recognize his need and to accept the word by overcoming his prejudices. But the people of Nazareth, they did not need anything from this carpenter of Nazareth except perhaps wooden benches and beds. Certainly not his word because they were so rooted in their prejudices. What about us? What about us in the context of we who are celebrating this Eucharist in the context of marriage and families and relationships? What do we see happening in our relationships? When we hear a perspective, an opinion or a thought that is different, not sinful, but different from us. Are we able to discern that because I am human, the truth is larger than what I see and that my perspective is not the only perspective? Now, when this happens and this becomes our attitude in life, there is so much of acceptance and understanding. But if not, if it's not there, then there is so much of rejection and misunderstanding. Don't we see that happening in relationships, in families and in homes? When I am fixed in my opinions, rigid in my stand, not as a matter of conviction, but the way I interpret or see reality, then I'm setting myself up for a series of conflicts. Because I'm, I remain confirmed in my prejudices and hardened in my positions. It could happen between a husband and wife, between parents and children and siblings, between in-laws. It could happen between neighbors or friends who have fallen off. We hold grudges against those who do not fall in line with, with us 
with our stand or fail to receive our version of events. We resent those who do not accept how I perceive, see or understand and interpret reality as though I am the only point of reference. And if we do not catch ourselves going down this path, we end up isolating, excluding, mocking and even gossiping about those who fail to think like us. We could end up, sadly, sitting on a high horse of holiness, occupying the throne of self-righteousness and positioning ourselves on the pinnacle of piety. How often we fail to see God coming into our lives simply because of our prejudices or because of our blind spots. In the Gospel, the words of Jesus precisely pricked the conscience of the people in Nazareth. Instead of seeing the words of Jesus as an invitation to change, to be converted, to repent, they stuck to their prejudices. They got very defensive, and I would say offensive, because they sought to take him to the top of the cliff so as to throw him over to his death. My dear sisters and brothers, as we celebrate this Eucharist, especially in the context of marriages and families, it is important and necessary to allow these readings to speak to us. We have a choice, really. Are we going to respond in a similar way that the people of Nazareth did, confirmed in our positions and practicing our prejudices? Or, I would like to believe that you and me and all of us in our relationships of home, families, friends, neighbors, place of work, will allow the words of Jesus to enlighten our minds, fall gently on our ears, penetrate our hearts, so that we become instruments of healing, just as the prophet Elisha was in the first reading, and instruments of redemption, as Jesus always is. So may it be in your life and in mine.